So speaker today is Pramila Chandra, AKA Premi. Premi, you should stand up. So I've known Premi from the... <laughs> I've known her from the time she was that big. <laughs> because she was an undergraduate at Yale and graduated from there with Soma Kam Laude, then went to Santa Barbara for a PhD, went to work in the industrial labs like uh, NEC, and then now settled down at Rutgers, where she's a professor, has been there for 15 years now. And she is a member of the American Physical Society, the Institute of Physics, and also a very active member in the governance of the Aspen Center for Physics. So she's going to talk today about the inner universe of quantum materials. That's somewhat unusual topic because by and large the topics on the public lectures have to do with the universe. And it's pretty reasonable that we are all interested in the universe. There's only one of its kind. But on the other hand, for the same reason, you cannot control the universe. It starts when it wants. Uh, it expands at any rate, cools at any rate it wants, and we are at best able to simply observe it and try to make sense of it using the laws of physics. But that's not true for the materials, the quantum materials that Framie is going to talk about. They are our captives. We can do to them what we want. We can compress them, we can expand them, cool them, heat them, torment them with radiation till they come up with a white flag and tell us what's going on. <laughs> so that's the sense of control that we like about quantum materials. And they play a big role in the world as you know it. For example, semiconductors, which are part of transistors and the old computers, are due to research in material science. And if one day there's a quantum computer, how do you think it's going to work? It's going to work with real materials that we got to figure out, that people like Premi have to figure out, and then somebody has to design it. So Premi has dedicated most of her life to studying materials. So I'm happy to present to you our answer to Madonna, our material girl. <laughs> Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shankar, for uh, your kind introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you, all of you for coming here tonight, and also more generally for your support of our center. As Shankar has already mentioned, it's a very special place for we physicists where we come to collaborate, to argue, to interact, and to think hard about the many puzzles that nature presents to us, of course inspired by your majestic mountains and the wonderful music. Today, I'm hoping to share with you some excitement that I have for the study of quantum materials, both for their technological applications, but also for their fundamental importance. When we bring together quantum mechanics and complexity, we get rich, exotic quantum phases whose constituents namely electrons, number as many as the stars in our observable universe. In that sense, I propose that quantum materials can be thought of as tunable universes, where their extreme behavior can be probed in the laboratory with far-reaching implications, both for our everyday life, but for our understanding of the greater cosmos. But let me not get ahead of myself. That's where we're going. Let me turn on this. Excuse me. There. That's where we're going. Let me see. Let's see how we're getting there. What's the plan today? The plan, first of all, is to unpack the title. What am I talking about when I say quantum materials? What does this have to do with the universe. So let's first unpack the title. Next, once we've done that, let's explore, model, and apply. Then, if there's time, I'd like to give you a couple of examples from some of my own pursuits. And finally, I'll end with hopes for the future. 
Now, before I continue, let me give you a personal story. When I was younger than I am now, <laughs> my parents had some friends over for dinner, and they bought me, brought me a present. And that present was a blue dog. And I was very confused. I said to the gentleman, I've never seen a blue dog. And he said to me, does that mean they don't exist? Afterwards, I told my father, blue dogs are weird. That gentleman thinks differently. And he smiled. Now, what does this have to do with our talk? Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, back to the familiar. Have you ever wondered, why do objects change color as they are heated? Why is matter so hard? Why are metals shiny? These are all questions that are from our everyday environment. But believe it or not, at the end of the 19th century, despite the triumph of unifying electricity, magnetism, optics, many other tremendous achievements, the scientific community could not answer these questions. In order to do so, we have to actually ask, what's inside a material? So let's take a common material found on Earth, one of the most common, iron. Now, first of all, iron is formed in the core of stars. It's believed that it came to the Earth a million years ago through a super, supernova explosion. So even these materials that we are studying have a link to the cosmos. So now, what's inside iron ore? So let's zoom in, and what we find is a crystal lattice. The iron atoms are arranged neatly, as shown here. And what are actually these units? Each of those units is an iron atom with a nucleus in the center composed of positive protons and neutral charged neutrons. That's the nucleus. And then a lot of electrons whizzing around, in this case 26, they're, they're negatively charged. You know that negative and positively charged objects attract. Most of those electrons stick very close to the nucleus, but some of them, in this case two or three, like to whiz around. Okay. All right, so what's inside of a material? A crystal lattice and electrons. Okay, what's a quantum material? Well, first of all, what's quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics, electrons are particles whose motion is determined by waves. Wait a minute, that's too confusing, you say. You're right. It is confusing. Just to give you an idea of how confusing it is, it's very counterintuitive, completely different than anything we see with our eye. So J.J. Thompson, a great physicist at Cambridge University, got the Nobel Prize for showing the world that electrons are particles. His son, Thompson, in, uh, independently with two scientists at Bell Labs, uh, Ger uh, uh, Gerverson and Dav Davis, actually showed that electrons, if you look at very short distances, like on the order of the distance between atoms in nickel, they act like waves. So here we have electrons every time we take, when we take snapshots, they're particles, but yet at the same time, Davison and Germer are the people with Chomson. So father got, got uh, realized that electrons are particles, son and other people found out that they're waves. What's this all about? It's weird and wonderful. And one of our quantum mechanic heroes, Richard Feynman, said, I can safely say that no one understands quantum mechanics. We learn the rules, we can calculate, but there are many aspects that we don't understand that are weird and wonderful. So what's a quantum material? 
what happens when we put these weird and wonderful electrons and let them run around in a crystal lattice? Well, the amazing thing is when we do so, we can understand the difference between metals and insulators. A metal is a material like aluminum, steel, gold, that can carry a current, conducts electricity. You might want to wire your house with it, though if you had enough gold to wire your house, you might think of doing something else. Insulators. Insulators do not conduct electricity. In fact, we often use them to protect, protect as protective covering for wires so that we have no crosstalk. Okay? So we can understand the difference between metals and insulators using these weird and wonderful electrons, quantum mechanical, plus the details of the crystal lattice. Now, it turns out that there's some materials that are in between metals and insulators, and Shankar already mentioned them, semiconductors. Semiconductors are materials that at low temperatures act like insulators, at high temperatures act like conductors, and it turns out that we can actually tweak with their properties. And they are very much the workhorse of, um, of the computer uh, age. We wouldn't be able to have transistors without semiconductors and et cetera, et cetera. So semiconductors are very important. Now let's go back to some of our questions. What makes a metal shiny? Turns out that in a metal, those free electrons that are running around that are important for conducting electricity also are little radiators. If you send light, which is an electromagnetic wave, they will reflect it back. Okay? And of course, if you have a smooth surface, you'll have a magnificent reflection. Okay? And it's because metals have those electrons running around that we have shiny metals. Why is it that when we heat something, it changes color? Okay? That's a really tough question. The reason it's tough is it turned out we had to give up and of course, when I say we, I mean the scientific community, we had to give up some long-held beliefs to understand this. In particular, we always thought that physical quantities like energy could come in any amounts. But what we had to do in order to understand this question was we had to realize that energy comes in units. It's a bit like buying milk at the store. You can buy it in half gallon, you can buy it in a gallon, but you can't go to the local supermarket and tell them you want three-eighths of a gallon. Okay? So energy and other physical quantities come in discrete units that we call quanta. Okay? And this was necessary to do to explain this very familiar phenomena. And indeed, what came out of the development of understanding why matter changes color as it gets hotter and hotter is the fact that we got a new particle called the photon, which is a unit of light. Okay? So that's what came out of that question. Last but not least, why is matter hard? It turns out that electrons have many physical quantities that come in discrete units. And one of them is spin. That's how they interact with the magnetic field. And for spin half, half objects, they carry around labels. They have to carry around the numbers associated with their various uh, discrete units that they're carrying around, whether it's energy or momentum or spin or whatever. And it turns out that these spin half objects are not very sociable. If there are two of them that have the same labels, they don't like each other. They repel. And that's something that we call the Pauli exclusion principle. And this plays a very important role in understanding the hardness of matter. It also is very important in the chemical diversity of the elements that we have around us. And finally, making a link to the greater universe, uh, let me tell you that neutrons, which we met before at the begin in the middle of the uh, atoms, these particles are also spin half, so they also obey the Pauli exclusion principle. And this same idea is the reason that we have stable neutron stars. So here we have concepts that we're learning about in the lab here, and in theory, that are extending far outside our planetary boundaries. 
All right. So are all materials then quantum? To some extent, yes. But all of this that I've told you about assumes that the electrons are all independent, headstrong beasts. What I want to know now is what happens when these electrons interact. So what's meant here by a quantum material? What if these weird and wonderful electrons interact or even know about one another? Okay, That's a whole other question. What happens if we have, there are many possible ways for them to interact, and that gives us complexity. So what happens if we have quantum mechanics plus complexity? Then we get something called emergent properties. What's emergence? Emergence says that the whole is greater or different than the sum of the parts. Let's look at some examples. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is very flammable. Let's combine it with oxygen. Oxygen is crucial for combustion. We add something flammable, something's crucial for a combustion. What do we get? Of course, water, which we use to put out fires. So the behavior of H2O is very, very different than the behavior of H2 and O by themselves. Similarly, we take sodium, which is a nasty reactive metal that you can cut with a knife. We add chlorine. Chlorine is a deadly, smelly gas. We put them together, and we get familiar table salt, which is biologically essential. So these are examples of how we have emergence. The whole has very different properties than the parts. Now here we were only talking about combining two, but what happens if we have many constituents? This will lead to even more complexity. And so the question then is, in our quantum material, just how many constituents do we have? How many electrons are running around that can interact? So let's ask the following question. How many electrons are in one gram of this iron buffalo bill? Okay, this is, this is some bouillon that I learned you could buy. How many electrons are in just one gram of iron? Well, you may remember from your chemistry that one gram of hydrogen is six times 10 to the 23 in Avogadro's number electrons. That's because in hydrogen, each atom has one electron and one proton. So if we have a gram of hydrogen, we have six times 10 to the three atoms, and therefore we have six times 10 to the 23 electrons. Now iron has neutrons in it, so it has more mass. It also has more electrons. So it turns out that 55 grams of iron becomes six times 10 to the 23 atoms. And then when we realize that there are 26 electrons per iron, we work it out that it's one gram of iron is three times 20, 10 to the 23 electrons. That's a huge number. That's one with 23 zeros after it. That's very hard to visualize. Let's ask another question. How many stars are there in our observable universe? Well, it turns out that we have approximately 100 billion stars per galaxy. And in our observable universe, we have, on average, 100 billion galaxies. So if we work it out, that's 10 to the 22 stars. Notice 10 to the 22 on the top, it's 10 to the 23. So the emergence is not only in the external universe, but if we have these 10 to the 23 electrons running around interacting with one another, then we have the possibility of all kinds of emergent structures in our quantum materials too. Now, let me make a cautionary note. Caution, there are analogies ahead. By no means do I mean, I, these analogies are guides for the mind to help you make, it, make contact between the unfamiliar and perhaps the familiar. All right, back to Earth now. If we have a ball 
on a slope, we expect that the ball will roll down and end up in its position with the least amount of energy. But if the ball were to stop midway, we would say, this isn't what we expect. What's going on? Could it be that there's a magnet there? Could it be that there's an electric field? What's going on? Okay. So in a similar sense, we have our universe, which is the lowest energy, compared to perhaps another universe. So in our universe, on Sunday, France won the World Cup. Vive la France. That was terrific. But in another universe, the US won the World Cup in a shutout against France. Now, how do I get to that universe? I don't know. But the point is, there is another universe where that could be the case. We don't know how to get there, but in materials, we can do tuning. Now, what do, so what I would like to present is that in quantum materials, we do have access to universes, different universes. So first of all, what do I mean by tunable? Well, we're probably all familiar with what I mean vis-a-vis -vis a musical instrument. For example, a guitar. You can tune a string to get the sound just right. And notice that that involves a knob. Here you're tuning the length of the string. So what are our tuning knobs? Our tuning knobs are pressure and magnetic field. Okay, so we tune, okay? So we can tune materials, put them under extreme conditions to find out what they're all about, okay? Now, I've learned, since I've been teaching, to always check whatever phrase I use in the Urban Dictionary to make sure I'm not saying something completely outlandish. <laughs> According to the Urban Dictionary, tuning has to do with getting people to get to know each other sort of with the idea that maybe they will increase their interaction later on. So in that sense, I guess we're all right. We can change the properties of quantum materials in the laboratory by tuning the electron interactions. Let me give you an example. There have been several predicted particles in our universe. The first was due to Paul Dirac. Dirac was fascinated by spin-a-half particles in the general family that we call fermions, electrons, neutrons, and their others. And he was wanted to combine ideas of quantum mechanics with those of special relativity. Special relativity was developed by Einstein. There we learned that no information can travel faster than the speed of light. And what Dirac asked was how do we combine what we learned with special relativity with quantum mechanics for particles, spin a half particles, finite mass, finite charge. When he worked through the equation, he got something unusual. He got two solutions. And he wasn't quite sure what to do. It's a little bit like taking a square root. If we take the square root of nine, we have two solutions, plus three and minus three. Okay, what do we do? Well, that was the situation Dirac had. First, he thought that one solution had positive charge, negative charge, the other had positive charge. So originally, he thought he had the electron and the proton. But then he realized that not only did it have positive and negative charge, it also had positive and negative mass. So that was something that required some imagination. He talked to his colleague, Herman Weil, who actually, from what I understand, persuaded him that this was actually an anti-electron. He had actually discovered antimatter. Okay? So he had discovered that every particle has an antiparticle that has the opposite, negative mass, negative charge. And we now call this the positron. Okay? And when an electron meets its antiparticle, the positron, we get light. All right, now Herman Weil, who had talked to Dirac about this, realized that he could simplify Dirac's equation. Dirac th thought about particles with finite mass and finite charge. Herman Weil said, what if we take mass to zero? Let's see what we have. And we now call that the Weil fermion, okay? 
So this is a relative, this is a fermion that comes out of the Dirac equation but has no mass. Okay? Majorana took the other approach. He said the original equation had finite mass, finite charge. Let's take a neutral particle that actually is its own antiparticle. Okay? So both the Weyl fermion and the Majorana fermion came out of simplifications of the Dirac equation. What's been observed in our universe? Antimatter, the positron, was actually detected in cosmic rays. We're still looking for the vile fermion. For a while it was believed that neutrinos were vile fermions, but now we know that neutrinos have mass. The jury is still out about whether neutrinos may actually be Majorana fermions. Now, the situation is somewhat different in quantum materials. I mentioned to you that an electron and a positron combine together to make light. And actually, our analog of a positron in quantum materials is something called a hole. And this light that I'm showing from the LED is actually the light that comes across from an electron and a hole coming together. Okay, So that's one example. Vile fermions have been observed now in a number of materials, and there are a number of people at the center now who are actually actively studying them. And the same is with Majorana fermions. They've actually, analogs of both vile and Majorana fermions have actually been observed in quantum materials. So here's an example where in our real universe, our external universe, I don't know what's real and what's not, our external universe, we have not seen these particles, but they have been observed in quantum materials, and in fact, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, vile fermions, because they're massless, are being considered strongly for fast electronic circuits, and Majorana fermions, if we can make enough of them, might be very useful for new forms of quantum computation. So that's where we are now. So in a nutshell, where are we? Quantum mechanics and complexity lead to quantum materials, and which we think of as tunable universes, and we have weird and wonderful things. OK, let's explore, model, and apply. Our multiverse playground is the periodic table. And this is sort of how people like me think of the periodic table. A lot of hydrogen, hard metals, copper, silver, gold, semiconductors, stuff that might not be real, won't be on the final exam, bombs, and other nasty stuff. Of course, the real periodic table looks like this. And it's a wonderful palette for developing quantum materials. We can explore, model, and apply. We want to characterize known territories and search for new ones. How do we do this exploration? Well, we turn a knob. Let's look at the familiar first. Let's take some ice. Suppose we crank up the temperature. We all know that ice melts. It turns into water. We crank up the temperature again, and it turns into water vapor. Okay. When we're turning up the temperature, what are we doing? We're heating it. And with heat, heat is a form of energy. We're giving energy to the motion of atoms. And this leads to thermal trans transformation of matter that we call thermal phase transitions classical phase transitions. This is very well described by classical physics. And where it, it goes from ice to water to water vapor, where we have these transitions, we call those critical points. Now, what happens when we go to very low temperatures? According to this picture, when we ver go to very low temperatures, everything should just freeze into ice. But that's not quite what happens. We have something called zero-point energy. But zero-point energy, this comes from something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Remember how we talked about how particles, the motion of particles, are guided by waves. Well, with waves, we have uncertainty. And what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us is that we can't know the position and the momentum with very high accuracy at the same time. In fact, if we know the position to high accuracy, we'll have a lot of uncertainty with the momentum 
and the other way around. Think of it as a wave. If we have a wavelength, we have a given momentum, we have a, but at the same time, we don't uh, know its position. So what this means is that if I, it, that I never really have a quantum system at rest. Momentum is related to its velocity. Neither the velocity nor the position can ever be zero, okay? Because if they are, there'll be an infinite uncertainty into the other one. So there, it's always, we have restless atoms. They're always jiggling around, and that's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So what it means is that atoms are still moving at very low temperatures. Helium, for example, which is a very light atom, it doesn't freeze, okay? You can lower it, lower it, lower it, lower it, and actually what happens is it becomes superfluid. It flows without friction. It's weird. It's nothing like we know, okay? Quantum transformations of matter. I should also point out that this zero-point energy may well be related to one of the mysteries of our universe, okay? We know that the universe is expanding, but we had originally thought that that expansion would slow down because of gravity. But now it's firmly established by astrophysical observation that the universe is actually accelerating expansion, which means that we must have a hidden source of energy to counteract gravitation. So there's something that we call dark energy, which is actually about 70% of the energy in the universe. All right, so we're only accounting for 40, which on an exam would not be very good. So Einstein had a notion that the energy of empty space associated with the zero point energy may be involved in something like that. And he called it his biggest blunder, but it was called the cosmological constant. People are going back to that idea now. Unfortunately, that doesn't explain the experimental observations. However, this zero point energy that we can play with in the lab by tuning pressure, by tuning temper uh, not temperature, pressure and field is very much related to these greater issues. So weird and wonderful states. So how do we model such complicated systems? Okay? If we're going to be explorers, we need a map. And in some sense, as a theorist, that's my job and my fellow theorists. So how do we model this? Okay. We want to be simple because we don't want unnecessary detail, but we don't want to be too simple. So let's take our cue from a great artist, Picasso. Okay. There are a wonderful series of lithographs which I've always found very inspiring. Let's look at this bull, very representational. Lots of wonderful, wonderful detail. Now look at this series of lithographs, and at the end, we can recognize that as a bull, but it only has a couple of masterful strokes. This is, this is very much the inspiration for what we want to do, the development of minimalist models for complex materials with lots of predictions for experiment. So what's our quantum Picasso minimalism? I would say it's Feynman diagrams, okay? The same Feynman who said that we don't understand quantum mechanics, the honest truth is he understood it better than most of us, okay? He developed what might look to you like squiggles. What is this? Okay, well, bear with me. Schrodinger, another of our um, quantum mechanical pioneers, taught us that quantum mechanics is a really big equation, okay? Just to give you an idea, the wave function which guides the particle motion looks something like this, and this is not just for one particle, two particles, this is for n particles, that astronomical number of particles that we just calculated before. Now, you may have plotted a function as a function of one variable, as a function of two variables, but can you imagine plotting a function as a function of 10 to the 23 variables? What a mess. Luckily, Feynman has come to the rescue, and he has this statement that quantum mechanics is the sum of all possible histories. Now, what does that mean? As I told you, quantum mechanics is weird and wonderful. Okay, it's completely counterintuitive. But let me give you a flavor for a Feynman diagram. In classical, in, in classical physics, if we have two particles, they scatter off of each other due to a force. For example, two negative particles, they repel, and that's because of the Coulomb force. Okay? 
In quantum mechanics, we don't have forces from a distance. What we have is the exchange of particles. So two electrons come in, they scatter off of each other <laughs> by exchange of something called a photon, that same photon that came out of looking at materials at high temperatures. Okay? Now, so this is the diagram, the Feynman diagram, that will show this. Now let's go to the other Feynman diagram. Let's think about a metal. Okay? So Feynman diagrams were originally developed to describe particle physics, but many people in the condensed matter solid state community decided to bring them to study materials. Now you might ask in a metal, if we have 10 to the 23 electrons, why, does it, why don't they all just repel each other? Okay? We know that we have some positive ions there, but what's going on? Okay? Now, it turns out that in a metal, an electron zooms along, but behind it is a cloud of positive charge. Okay? And so it's what we call screened. Okay? It mutes the interaction between the two electrons that would like to be repulsive. Okay? So let's see how this works with a Feynman diagram. And here, don't worry if the words are a little bit different. I just want to show, give you a flavor for what Feynman did for us. So we have two electrons coming in, A and B. A sends off a photon. The photon, remember, light can turn into an electron and, in our case, a hole, okay? matter and antimatter. But this is what's called virtual. It doesn't exist for very long. It just exists for a little while. Then this electron and hole recombine. You exchange a photon, and the other electron receives a photon and scatters off. That's the Feynman diagram for screening. Now, just to give you an idea of how minimalist it is, here's the equation associated with that for this, what we call the scattering amplitude. So this would be the representational part, and this is the minimalist one. Now, these diagrams actually were crucial in determining some fundamental parameters in particle physics to incredible high accuracy, one part to ten, uh, one in 10 to the 10. So, it's a way of, it's a minimalist approach that to me is a bit of our quantum Picasso. All right, the la let's now talk about apply. I come from New Jersey, so of course any discussion about apply or invention has to go to Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, of course, was one of the key inventors of the light bulb. And if you go to visit his lab in West Orange, New Jersey, you'll learn that he tested more than 6,000 materials to find the right filament. Okay? All right. So he had an idea, he had a concept, but it took a lot of effort and sleepless nights to get to the right filament. And as it turned out, he got to carbonized bamboo, which is not what we use today. Okay? We use tungsten, if we use light bulbs at all. All right. What's a modern accelerated Edisonian approach, the modern idea is to do high throughput computational searches in conjunction with experiment. So let me give you a taste of something I'm involved in. There are many functions, devices, where we don't have the right material. So for example, I'm involved in some work with transducers. A transducer means that you can you convert one energy to another. So for example, you apply pressure, you get an electric signal. They're very important for sensors. It turns out that lead-based materials are really good sensors, but many of us would like to be in a somewhat lead-free world. And so the question is, can we come up with some other materials that work as well? So the approach that we're taking is sort of a layer cake approach. The idea is you take two materials, each of which has one of the desired properties, and make a layer cake out of it. And hope, as we all do, that the children have the best, pro best qualities of the parents. So this is just a picture of one of my experimental colleagues' systems. And here again, the goal is to identify and characterize multi-component layer structures with desired properties. So this is the modern way of doing the Edisonian method. But of course, this is not going to take us from the light, from the light bulb to the LED. Okay? For that, we need a conceptual advance. Okay? And I used to work for many years in industry. And often, when I was working on something, people would come by and say, of what, um, how, how is this going to lead to an application? And I was always reminded of a story 
one of my heroes, Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was completely self-taught. And by studying magnetic fields and how they interacted with electri electrical circuits, he developed the idea, which we now call as Faraday induction, which is crucial for generators, motors, all of this stuff. And when he one day, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that's a bit like the Secretary of the Treasury, came to his lab and asked him to do a demonstration, William Gladstone. And so he did a demonstration and said, but after all, what use is it? And Michael Faraday said, why, sir, there is every probability that you will soon be able to tax it. <laughs> anyway, so explore, model, apply. Okay? We've investigated a little bit of that. Another blue sky research item that I'm always reminded of is when I was an undergraduate, I heard about atomic clocks to check ideas of general relativity. They're very, very sensitive to, they're very, very sensitive clocks. Nowadays, we all rely on atomic clocks because they're crucial for a global position system. So that's an example where atomic clocks were, rare, were, were made better and better for a purely blue sky approach, but then they became un, uh, uh, unexpectedly practical. Okay, so let me just now give you a taste of an example. Okay, I like history a lot. Wilbur and Orville Wright, as you know, were the inventors, or key inventors for the airplane. And if you learn about them, you realize that they took a rather different approach to other people. In quantum materials, many people study them to understand novel materials, novel metals, novel magnetic systems. But these are very, very complex systems. What Wilbur and Orville Wright did was rather than everyone else who was interested in making fancier and fancier and bigger and bigger engines, they focused on what they had to do for the pilot to be able to steer the plane and to keep it in equilibrium. Okay? So they, of course, were from bicycle, had worked in a bicycle shop, and they were aware that you could learn to control a system in equilibrium. So in that sense, one of the questions that a number of us have asked is, can we take a system that's very simple and look at this quantum behavior? Now, I'm going to, I, I want to make sure there's time for questions, so I'll just give you a sense of this. These systems are ferroelectrics. Ferroelectrics have an electrical polarization analogous to a ferromagnet, okay? Um, and when these, pol when these polarizations are all lined up, it's a bit like a magnet but it's like an electrical magnet. And these systems are used for many room temperature applications. So they've been studied a lot for a lot of applications. And one of the questions you could ask is, what happens at low temperatures? So at low temperatures, let's look at this. And this is from the Cambridge group, some of whom are represented here. Let's look at this ferroelectric. Here we have temperature and pressure. Let's start in the ferroelectric phase. As we raise the temperature, we just get a classical phase transition. And this has been known for a very long time. But now let's go into the ferroelectric phase and let's actually change the pressure. When we change the pressure, and what we're doing when we're changing the pressure is we're tuning the zero point energy, if you will, the dark energy inside this, this matter. What we find is the behavior here is very different than the behavior there, okay? Now what we can ask, we can use this as a building block. We can say there are many ways to change the pressure. We can turn a crank, but we can also do it chemically by putting in different ad, um, elements that are slightly bigger or smaller, whether we want compressive or expansive pressure. So what happens when we do that? And this is, done, this is some work by the Paris group. Well, they said, what happens if we apply pressure but also sprinkle charge? Okay? and that they did with oxygen vacancies. When they do that, they find that they get ferroelectricity, but they also get superconductivity. So let's talk a little bit about superconductivity. We add charge, we get not only an unusual metal, but an exotic superconductor. It breaks many known rules. Weird and wonderful. So a superconductor has zero electrical resistance. That means that if you want to work with your laptop on your lap, it won't get hot, you won't have to recharge it. 
Okay? That would be great if it were room temperature, but we don't have that yet. It also expels magnetic fields, okay? and that's this famous levitation experiment. Superconducting temperature versus year of discovery, they've been around for a while. In the 50s, a certain type of superconductor associated with electrons and lattices was very well understood. But since 1985, we've actually had a whole number of new superconductors that defy our conventional explanation. Now, you may notice that here, when I look at temperature versus year, I'm only around liquid nitrogen, which is 77 degrees Kelvin, but is more like minus 300 Fahrenheit. So it's not exactly practical, practical yet. But one of the hopes is that we can actually get these temperatures up. Luckily, liquid nitrogen is not that expensive. So why are we interested in unconventional superconductivity? The first are new concepts. I mentioned that we have that superconductors expel fields. Okay? That's the cause of this levitation. We call that the Meissner effect. Turns out that this is this, the normal to superconducting transition involves not only our usual ideas of transformations, but also some long range interactions due to the fact that we have electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic field. That turns out to be the cause of the fact that we have a finite penetration depth the field cannot penetrate more than a certain amount in the superconductor. Okay. Now, the understanding developed by Anderson of that turned out to be a very similar problem that the particle physicists were thinking about. The particle physicists were thinking about a similar problem in the context of the electroweak interaction. That's electromagnetism plus the interaction involved with radioactivity. And so it's now called the Anderson-Higgs mechanism. And as you probably know, Higgs went on to predict the Higgs boson. Interestingly enough, superconductivity played two roles in the identification of the Higgs boson. One was conceptual through this Anderson-Higgs mechanism, but the other is they actually used superconducting magnets for the high fields that were used in the experiment. So the question is, if for the mechanism and design of high temperature superconductors, what new is going to come there? What are possible applications? Improved power transmission. We lose about 20% of our power uh, from power station to our homes. Large magnetic fields that would give us better resolution. Superconducting magnetic energy storage. Uh, with renewable energy, we need more energy storage. Wind power generation, on and on. So let me now talk about hopes uh, uh, for the future. In the cosmos, we know from astrophysical observations that a significant fraction of the mass of the universe is unaccounted for. We talked already about how energy is unaccounted for, but we also know that there's mass that's unaccounted for. It doesn't interact with light or electromagnetic radiation in any way. So that's a serious challenge to the scientific community. What are our dark matter challenges? Okay. Let me give you just a flavor for these. Strange and bad metals. This strange and bad metals are metals that we don't understand either at high temperatures or at low temperatures or both. Okay? Like people, you can be strange or bad or both. <laughs> and we have a little bit of either, all. High temperature superconductivity. That's an outstanding issue. And there's a lot of active discussion about this. Quantum phase transitions. With classical phase transitions, those due by temp to temperature, we know that there's a certain amount of what we call universality, that the details of the material don't matter, just certain characteristics. We can't yet say that with quantum phase transitions. Interactions and disorder. I've assumed perfect crystals, okay? But we know in that they're ever-present ever disorder. How do we include disorder in all of this? And then I should also say that it was always assumed in the past that insulators, well, they're sort of boring, okay? We can't conduct electricity, but now we're having to revise our opinion about that. It turns out that we, we combine ideas from mathematics with our ideas of physics, we get some very interesting properties. In particular, in if, when, if the wave function of the many body electrons somehow gets tied into a knot, then we have some very interesting properties of the material. And there's a whole workshop going on now on these topological 
kinds of systems. Strange insulators. There are some materials that have an identity issue. When you apply a, a, an a electric field, they think they're insulators. When you apply a magnetic field, they think they're metals. <laughs> Definitely strange. We don't know what's going on. And finally, quantum computation. The 20th century brought tremendous revolutions in quantum mechanics and in computational science. And the 21st century is the time to bring them together. Interestingly enough, these vial and these Majorana fermions that have been discovered in materials are prime candidates for quantum, what we call topological quantum computation. Quantum states are notoriously delicate to interaction with the environment. But these kinds of particles are actually robust due to mathematical reasons and may actually provide interesting ways to develop new types of technologies. So in a funny way, the inner universe is shining within. Here are particles that were predicted but only seen in materials, and we may actually be able to harness them in our weird and wonderful universe. So, of course, the, end, the list goes on and on, and there are probably many areas that I don't even know about yet that perhaps some of you will uh, discover. I'd like to end with the memories of a great Aspen Center physicist that many of you know, David Pines, who is very dear to many of us who we lost last spring. David transformed our understanding of quantum matter. And he, he was a pioneer in the conventional ideas of superconductivity and was working very hard to try and understand unconventional ideas. He also always thought out of the box, and there was tremendous cross-fertilization of his ideas, both to nuclei and to neutron stars. One of his favorite sayings was, what we don't understand we explain to each other. And in some sense, that's I can think can be a motto of the Aspen Center. So David did a David, of course, did a, had very intense discussions with many of us, and we miss him dearly. But of course, his influence is very much still with us. And last Friday, a group of us went to one of his favorite restaurants in town and had a toast to him and shared some lovely memories of him. He was a wonderful friend. All right, I'd like to end with a personal reminiscence. When I was a rebellious teenager, I was doing some reading. And I was fascinated by the special theory of relativity and by quantum mechanics, and I wanted to know how to bring them together. So I did some reading, most of which I didn't understand. But I came across an equation that seemed like poetry. And it predicted antimatter. And I went to my father and I said, whoever came up with this equation must have had amazing imagination. And my father turned to me and said, do you remember that blue dog? That was he. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Premi. You delivered as promised. Now, you've also given us enough time to answer some questions, and I'm going to let Premi run the show, call on members of the audience, take the questions. I remember, no one understands anything, so if you don't understand, <laughs> welcome to the club. We're all looking, oh, I forgot to end with the fact that I told this story to David Pines about the blue dogs, and he laughed. And he said, in many ways, we're all searching to understand blue dogs. <laughs> That's how I meant to end. <laughs> but I was running out of time. And I should say that thanks to this story, for me, personally, quantum mechanics has always been inextricably linked to blue dogs. <laughs> yes? 
you have a sense of uh, when we're going to see uh, quantum computers that are able to surpass the uh, current, current state of supercomputers by the magnitude that they are predicting? That's a very tough question. We have many colleagues who are working hard on them. And certainly, we have many places like Microsoft and Google that are investing serious amount of money in them. At the, at the present time, we are able to do specialized forms of computation for specialized problems. But there's still a way to go. But there's a lot of enthusiasm and effort. And so I hope it will be in the near future. That's the best I can do. Yes. Can you explain a little bit about how quantum computers will work? You know, the, the mechanics behind them? OK, that's. <laughs> the, <laughs> OK, so first of all, we don't understand quantum mechanics and we don't understand quantum computers, and you want me to explain one of the other. <laughs> By the way, Shankar was one of my teachers, so <laughs> I know who to go to. Anyway, I'll give it a shot. OK. In our conventional computation, what we do is we have a grid and we store information at each node. Okay? So it's stored in zeros and ones. Okay? So if for some reason you lose the node, you lose the information. You may recall that I said that, from, that Feynman taught us that quantum mechanics is the sum of all histories. It turns out that in a quantum computer, because it's a sum of all histories, in principle, you could do a lot of parallel quant computation. And that's what makes it so powerful. Because in a quantum mechanical state is a linear superposition of many, many states. And so the notion is that you could speed things up amazingly enough because of the superposition. Do you, do you have anything to add? I, know it's, I wish I was quantum computation. It means you can do many things at the same time and also be at many places at the same time. That's right. But those things don't apply to microscopic things like us. Yes. So that's the idea. And, and, but the, the difficulty is that it's very, very tricky to maintain what we call the coherence that allows us to have this parallel, these parallel processes going on if we want to interact with the environment. And so one of the reasons people are very excited about some of these topological particles, like Majorana fermions or vial fermions, is in principle, uh, they might be protected by some sort of mathematical symmetry. But it's, you know, getting, going from, from the concept to the practice is a whole other story. I think you can say that when a quantum computer is computing, you shouldn't talk to it. <laughs> it's about it anyway. Everything is gone. You've got to start all over again. So you have to keep it away from everything, but then it won't talk to you either. So you want it to talk <laughs> to the beginning when you ask the question. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. When it's ready, you ask the question, the act, they will give you the answer, and that's the end. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Would you verify our, this uh, idea of uh, energy? Uh, it, it, uh, there's dark energy and there's dark mass, and both of them we don't are unknowns to us. The dark energy has to do with the fact that the universe is its expansion is accelerating, and we don't understand what's the cause of that. Okay, the dark mass has to do with the fact that we know that gravity requires mass, and yet the mass that we can see with all forms of electromagnetic radiation don't account for the fact that the galaxies are falling apart. So in that sense, it's slightly different. So you just use the term falling apart as opposed to expansion? Oh, that's for the galaxies. Okay. For the galaxies, because they're individual constituents of the galaxies, stars, mm -hmm. and it's gravity that's holding them together. But given the size of the galaxy, we don't see enough of the matter to why they're, they're together. 
So one is about the galaxies, the other is about the universe. But you're right that Einstein taught us that energy and mass are related, so it's really mass energy density, and we have many uncertainties there. Yes? I'm not sure I know how to phrase this, but it sounds to me like quantum mechanics is an explanation of things on a very small level, very microscopic level. Is there a bright line so where quantum mechanics explains the um, activity of a material and where it doesn't? It really depends on what length scale one's interested in, if that's what you're asking. Remember that the waves that guide the motion of electrons have a, a length scale. And so, for example, for, for wiring our house, we don't have to worry about the the wave nature of the electrons, but if we're interested in a nickel crystal, we do. So there's something called the de Broglie wavelength, and that sort of sets the stage for when, when um, quantum mechanics is important and when it isn't. Yes? It sounded from your talk that you had both a scientific interest to explain to people like me what's going on with science, but also a public policy interest to explain why it's worth <laughs> yes. So to what extent has, has the pressure to, to talk to that public changed over your career? And to what extent do you, do, as, do you as physicists feel the need to make sure that we as the general public understand why it's important that you do this science? Well, first of all, I'm always happy to share my excitement with anyone who's willing to listen. So thank you very much. Um, of course, Research funding, research also requires funding. And from that standpoint, it has become more and more of a necessity over my career to make this point clear to the powers that be. And so we all have to do a little bit of that. Uh, yes? Um, can you say anything about, I guess I remember reading about the idea of consciousness in quantum mechanics and if it, you think it's far out or if it's People ask me if quantum mechanics applies to the human brain. And I said, if the brain is small enough, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now you understand why I went into physics. <laughs> Teachers like this. Yes. Um, I, I think you did, whenever I hear quantum, my head starts to hurt. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, I think you did a great job with this. Thank you. Uh, and I noticed that stayed away from information really until we got to the question period. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about quantum security, security keys based on quantum mechanics, which actually seems to be coming much closer to the application. To, to that. I have to say that I don't know that much about this. Do you know? Well, I don't know very much, but that never stopped me from talking. <laughs> <laughs> what I understand about quantum information transfer is if I send you some information using the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, Nobody can intercept it. Interception is the act of disturbing the system, and they won't. They will destroy the information I'm sending, but they won't be able to read it. I also heard that you cannot also make copies of quantum information. No. That's right. You can't clone. No clone theory. No cloning. What? What does that mean? I'm <coughs> you can't. You cannot make a duplicate of quantum information. But better to say you cannot intercept it. If you intercept it, you destroy it. Yes. Do you see quantum computing eventually being a problem with, with mm -hmm. cyber security? You know, quantum computer. Uh, I see. This is probably beyond my skill set. Well, I don't know too much about <laughs> this. All I know is what you read. Yes, that's all I know. I, I honestly, I don't know enough well, about it. And I'm actually not sure if I'm even if able to read what's known about this. Yes. So if you can't duplicate quantum, how do you work with it? I mean, how do you even communicate with it or change it or alter it or use it? Uh, you can meddle with it. I'm t what, I'm, what I've seen shown to me, well, I think I don't want to use words whose meanings have a different interpretation for you than what they mean to me. I would say in the standard parlance that we use every day, I cannot really answer that question. I have, a, I have a view that certain things 
we cannot really explain in terms of daily usage because I'll get the impression I've conveyed it to you, but what you hear and what I'm saying are very different. Yes. In, in your work and among your colleagues, <coughs> do you encounter in the U.S. much classified restrictions? <coughs> are any of your colleagues limited in what they can tell you, or are you limited in what you can tell them? I, I think in the area of quantum computation, that's an issue. But since I haven't been working in that so much, I am not affected. But in quantum computation, there's a lot of work that's, I think, uh, not, not for public access. So where is the funding coming for the application of quantum computing? Trying to build the memory storage devices and the gates and stuff like that. So there's a lot of... Maybe can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Where does the funding come for quantum computation? For the application, for the application of quantum computation. The government has quite a lot of funding, particularly from the Defense Department, DOD, in the U.S. government. Also, a number of industries, Google, Microsoft, and there are a number of startups that are very keen on this. So there's both the private and the public sector. I believe in Europe there's also a big network where they're also very keen as well. Do yes? Do private sectors share information just as you do here? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> does the private sector share information? But I'm not sure if the government sector, all of it does either. <laughs> so the question was, does the private sector share the information that they find? And the answer is probably no. And there are parts of the government sector, particularly the classified parts, that probably don't either. Uh, yes. And, okay. I think it's crucial. It is crucial? Absolutely. What do you think distinguishes those that overcome failure and then succeed? Talent, luck, <laughs> all those things. I mean, one of the things, I, I worked in, in industry uh, at a place called NEC Research Institute before coming to university. And it was an offshoot. It was um, a research institute set up by a Japanese company, NEC, that makes memory chips. But it was an, uh, there were many people there. It was in New Jersey, and it was an offshoot from Bell Labs, which is sort of the crown jewel in terms of industrial research. And one of the things that I liked a lot about every, every three years we had to give it in a report of our work. And one of the things I thought was really good about it was they always asked us what we had done, but they also asked us what did we tried that failed. Of course, if that list was too long compared to the other list, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> but the point was that we were asked specifically, what did you try that didn't work? Because the notion is you're not pushing the boundaries. Okay? And you have to have a good reason for thinking it'll succeed. And then if it doesn't, retool, try again. But I think, fail I think when, as scientists, we get used to failure. Our garbage cans are full. <laughs> yes? Everybody's asking you about quantum computing, but looking at your applications, it seems like you're much more knowledgeable about a high temperature superconductor. And my question is really, at what point do you think we are in the uh, phase of learning and of applications where superconductors will become practical? Well, I would love it to be soon, but I honestly can't say. At the moment, the superconductors, the, the key temperature is, it's a cold temperature, 77 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 300 Fahrenheit. But the point is that liquid nitrogen is about the same price as beer. So, in principle, we could have special purpose applications with some of the superconductors we have. The problem is they're ceramic, so it's very difficult to make wires out of them. But people are working hard at that. So, for special purpose applications, I think it, they're already happening. But for widespread applications, we're still working on it. Also, if you go to Siberia, slide. you can have room temperature superconductors. <laughs> <laughs> your first slide, when you're looking at metals and insulators. Yes. Are they doing work on insulators such to be able to uh, insulate basically superconductors to maintain the cold? Well, that's a whole other issue. And yes, people are working on uh, insulators exactly for those kinds have of purposes. Are they making great advances in that? We're making slow advances, slow advances. But I think 
there's a tremendous amount of hope for the future. Actually, it's interesting because we talk about the fact that the superconductors have to have high temperatures, but what we really want is for them to have high critical currents so we can run high currents and get high fields, for example, for MRIs. Uh, the better, the higher the field, the better the resolution I've been, I, I've been led to believe. And so there's a lot of work on that. Maybe there's somebody over Yes, there. sorry. Will the universe expand to a point where our future scientists won't be able to observe it? Uh, okay, that's, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> I think by the time it's gotten to that point, we might have other problems. <laughs> uh, yes? How does the different combinations of recipes of temperature and pressure affect our ability to observe the behaviors of the waves? And can we, can we predict? By the, lowering the temperature, by raising the temperature, by lowering the pressure, by raising the pressure. That's exactly what our experimental colleagues do. Of course, we can never get to zero temperature. But what we can do is get to low enough temperatures such that we have both the thermal fluctuations, but we have also the zero point fluctuations. And there's very close uh, collaboration between theory and experiment, spe two specific settings to understand what effects that will have. So it's very closely related to what you're asking. And thanks, Shankar.